we will be starting the course very soon. As advertised, it was 8.45, inshallah. If you have got any of your adhkar um, after Maghrib, please do so. We will have a short Q&A section as well. Um, at the end, um, you have the opportunity to um, send in your questions via the bit.ly link that was shared out, inshallah. Inshallah, we will share that on the chat function for everybody to see. Um, and once, if you do have any other questions and you don't want to send it onto the bit.ly link, you can just go onto the chat function on Zoom and just send the question just to the Nusratul Islam admins. So you can just select um, Nusratul Islam. You will see the two hosts. Inshallah, you can send your questions there. So without further ado, Inshallah, um, I'd like to hand over to the Imam Sab, uh, Mawlana Muhim, to Inshallah, take us through this session on Polishing up our tarawih, insha'Allah. Jazakallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli wa nusallimu ala rasulihi al-kareem. Amma ba'd, fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi. Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina wa habibina wa shafi'ina wa maulana muhammadin wa barik wa sallim. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته everyone جزاك الله for joining us إن شاء الله just two months ago we had a بيان in Jumu'ah on the importance of preparing for the month of Ramadan. And whilst discussing Taraweeh and the importance of Taraweeh, it was mentioned that the, if we really look at Taraweeh, uh, we would see that the entire beauty of the month of Ramadan is really in Taraweeh. You know, if we didn't have Taraweeh, then, um, you know, really Ramadan would have just been like a normal uh, month where people are just fasting. So the fact that we have uh, Taraweeh in the month of Ramadan, that really adds the beauty to the month of Ramadan and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an that the month of Ramadan is the month wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Qur'an. So the month of Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an and we fulfill the rights of the Qur'an by reciting the Qur'an and by listening to the Qur'an in Taraweeh. Unfortunately, um, one of the things that was mentioned in, in that bayan uh, on the day of Juma was that imagine if we had no such thing as Taraweeh. And wallah, it really baffles me that after two months, we've come to a situation where we are now delivering um, a session on how to perform Taraweeh Salah at home and how to make the most out of our Taraweeh. Um, we, re we really didn't know that this... Um, situation would come upon us and this is a dua that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, would teach us that Allahumma inni a'udhu bika Allahumma inni as'aluka min fuja'ati al-khayr wa na'udhu bika min fuja'ati al-shar a dua of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and really we should learn these duas um, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would ask Allah oh Allah Allahumma inni as'aluka min fuja'ati al-khayr that oh Allah I ask for sudden uh, goodnesses you know, goodness which we don't expect. And we seek protection. We seek your protection from sudden calamities, sudden harm, evil that comes our way. And subhanAllah, two months ago, we're delivering a bayan on the importance of taraweeh. We never knew that a situation would, uh, or uh, something like this would actually happen where we're having to sit here and deliver um, how to perform uh, taraweeh at home. So today, inshallah, um, first of all, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah makes it easy. Uh, there's a lot to cover. Um, there is a lot to cover today, um, and I'm going to try and finish on time, inshallah. Um, so I will be zooming it. We will go really quick, inshallah. So this, this session that we have, it will be recorded. So if anyone does need to come back to the Tajweed rules, uh, please do so. We'll upload it on our YouTube uh, channel. So please do come back to it. Uh, but I will be um, zooming it because I don't want to 
uh, take too much of your time. So nevertheless, whether we perform our taraweeh uh, at home or in the masjid, we do know that the rewards, subhanAllah, which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, which Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim both have recorded in their um, collections of ahadith, that whoever, man qama fi ramadana imana wa ahtisaba, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambih. And Allah, every night before starting taraweeh, we should contemplate over these, the, the beautiful words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he says that whoever stands in, in the nights of Ramadan, uh, out of faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with ihtisab, hope of reward, then all his previous sins will be forgiven. So before starting our taraweeh, we should also include this in our intention. This hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Oh Allah, I am standing in taraweeh so that all my sins, my previous sins may be forgiven inshallah. So anyway, just a quick overview of what we would be covering today. Uh, the first thing we'd be covering is are the four core tajweed rules, inshallah. Um, obviously, if we're performing uh, uh, taraweeh, then what we want to do is, if we will be reciting Quran in 20 rakats for the next 30, 29 to 30 days, uh, the, the nights, then we want to recite them properly. And this is not only for uh, the month of Ramadan, but it's for the rest of our lives, inshallah. So um, I hope, inshallah, it will be helpful. So we will be covering the four core tajweed rules today. And then after that, inshallah, we'll be... Um, We'll be doing a guided reading on the last 10 surahs. So these are popular surahs. These are surahs which we uh, recite in our salah day in, day out. So it's, 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 it'll be good, inshallah. It'll be beneficial that we go over um, the surahs um, and how we should be reciting them surahs. And then along with that, we'll also look at the tafsir and a little overview. So I can't even call it tafsir, to be honest with you, because we can't spend too much time on every surah. So just an overview so that when we recite those surahs, so for example, now in Maghrib, if you recited uh, Surah Kafirun, for example, or if you recited Surah Lahab, or any of the surahs from the last 10 surahs, what will be nice is that you also know what, what, what you're reading, or if not what you're reading, then what is the what is it? What does Allah want for me to take from this surah? That is important. So if I'm reading Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad wa Lam Yakullahu Kufwan Ahad, what we should also know what message is it that Allah wants me to take from this surah whilst I'm reading it. So that's what we want to do tonight, inshallah. And the, la the, the last thing that we will be covering is Taraweeh guidelines during the, this pandemic. So I'll, again, my colleague Mufti Dilwar Sab uh, will inshallah um, be covering that part. So we're just going to quickly start, inshallah, um, with regards to Taraweeh, uh, sorry, with regards to uh, Tajweed. We all know that there are core rules of Tajweed and there are non-core. So this is important for us to know that the core rules, so which, which you would call the fara'is, fara'is, meaning them rules we need to know. We need to know them rules. And they're, they're the rules that we will be covering today, inshallah. Because the core rules, if we neglect them, then the rules, uh, sorry, uh, then what happens is if we neglect these rules, it, it can change the meaning of the Qur'an. So the, the rules that we'll be covering today is the core rules. The non-core rules, for example, those of you who have studied Tajweed Ikhfa, you have Gunna, uh, you have, uh, for example, uh, um, Ikhfa Shafawi, and all these different types of uh, rules, they are known as, although they're very important, so don't get me wrong, please, here, that oh, we've, we've just made a core and the non-core, so which means as long as we study the core, that's enough. No, uh, what we want to do is we want to study both, but I just want to put, place that importance on the core rules. So uh, the non-core rules, they are those uh, which by, by, by adding the non-core rules to our recitation, it will make the recitation more beautiful, inshallah. So starting off with the, um, the core rules, the first rule is the twin letters. Now, if you've never heard of it, um, and if it's the first time, this is something which we really stress on in our maktab uh, to our students as well, and anyone who we teach Tajweed to, because Alhamdulillah, all of us, we've learned our letters, right? When it comes to letters, uh, we studied when we were five, six, some of you, maybe three, when you studied uh, learning the, the alphabets. Um, now, something that we weren't taught, or maybe we missed it, was that the twin letters, there are, there are certain letters in the Arabic language. So we have 29 letters. Out of the 29, these letters that we have, uh, they are classed, I've, I've given them the name, the twin letters, because they, they don't look the same. They, they sound the same, 
but they're not exactly the same. So this is important for us to know that they sound very similar, but they are not exactly the same. And it's important that we recognize how to pronounce each one uh, or else we'd, we'd be basically muddling them, we'd be getting them wrong. So when we're reading the Quran, instead of a ta, we might read a ta. Instead of a qaf, we might read a kaf. And this is a major issue because it can change the meaning. I'll give you an example. For example, we have qul huwallahu ahad. Qul huwallahu ahad. So the qul is with a qaf, qaf and lam. Now, if, if an individual reads qul huwallahu ahad, qul with a kaf, now this is crazy. The, like qul means say, say. Um, and that's an order that say, but kul with a kaf, it means eat, right? So you can see it's, 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 it can actually change the meaning, right? So you have the famous example which people give is um, qalbun and kalbun. So the word qalb with a kaf, it means heart. The word kalbun with a kaf means a dog. So can you see the difference? And this, um, so sometimes it changes the meaning. Sometimes it doesn't actually change the meaning, but it destroys the meaning. So this is the reason why these letters, we need to be extra cautious with them. So we'll just quickly go over it. We have Ain and Hamza. So for example, um, sometimes you'll have the letter Ain. So you'll have Alayhim or An'amta, An'amta. Or we have A'udhu. So in A'udhu, when we read A'udhu, the first one is a Hamza and the second letter is a Ain. So some of us, we read A'udhu, A'udhu. So we're actually reading both as Hamzas. So these, these are important. Then we have Ha and Ha. So Ha and Ha, again, they can change the meaning. Sometimes they'll change the meaning. Sometimes they won't change the meaning, but they'll just destroy the meaning. Uh, we have Ha and Gha. So these are, again, um, they're, they're kind of similar because the, this is a letter which a lot of people tend to make. Like instead of ha, we, we, we would read ra, right? Or instead of rain, we would read ha, right? So these are letters that we really need to be careful on. Then we have tha and sa. So for example, the word thalath, the word thalath means three and the word salas has no meaning. Right. So if, if, if we read the Quran and we say Thalathata and instead of Thalathata, we say Salasata. So what, we're, what we've done now is we've actually then we've read a word which has no meaning in the Arabic language. Then we have the and za, the and za. Now, again, once again, I'm, I'm apologizing. I have to zoom through this. So if you do have to come back to it, do come back to it. And like I've put down th this. These rules, I've taken it from Simple Rules of Tajweed. And it's a, it's a book printed in South Africa. You could actually get the free version on PDF. So you could actually come back to this as well, and inshallah, learn it. Um, get a teacher, um, learn how to pronounce the letters properly. Even if we could do that, just learn how to pronounce our letters properly. We've actually sorted half of our Tajweed issues out. So we have the and za. So again, we don't want to get this muddled up. Same with the. So you have three letters. These are not twins. We could call them triplets if you want. The, the, and za. The, the, and za. So for example, you have a'udhu. It's not a'udhu. So a lot of people, they, we, we would hear them when, when reading, they would say a'udhu, right? So again, it's completely wrong. Then we have the letters sod and seen. So you have sa, so, and you have sa. Now, I'll give you an example of sa and sa. You have safe, which means a sword. Safe with a scene. Saif means weather. Right? So can you see the difference, subhanAllah, in just reading a letter with or uh, the word salla means to take your sword out. The word salla with a sword, salla means durud upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So can you see, it, it, it does change the meaning. So this is something which we really need to take very seriously. We have ta and ta. So again, a common mistake. For example, some would read sirat al Sirat al It's not sirat al sirat al It's a ta. Then we have dad and dal. Right? So wala dalin. It's read full mouth, not an empty mouth. So da wala dalin, dalin. The, the dal means the one who um, guides, right? So the dal and dal means the one who misguides. So can you see how 
uh, just a, a, a small difference in pronouncing the, the letter Dad and Dal can change the meaning. Meaning, and then uh, at the end, we have the Qaf and the Kaf. Um, again, I've given you examples of Qul. Uh, so whenever you read Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun or Qul Huallahu Ad, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Falaq, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Nas, we need to be cautious, we need to ensure. And like I said, these are core Tajweed rules. So this is the first one. And this is why if you're a parent, um, if you do not know how to pronounce your letters properly, please do not teach your children, right? Because it's blind, then leading the blind. You know, sorry if, if anyone takes the offense, but sometimes what happens is we, we're very uh, enthusiastic and we want to teach our children, especially during this lockdown period. During this lockdown period, if, if you are teaching your children and, and if, you're, if you're weak in your letters and how to pronounce them, then what would happen is your children, their foundation will be wrong. And sadly, if they grow up learning, uh, not pronouncing the letters properly, then they've already started off with a failure, you know, in, in making mistakes. So this is the reason why we spend a lot of time on uh, letters uh, uh, at the beginning. And if you open the Safar Qaeda, you would see that the letters, subhanAllah, we spend a lot of time on letters until uh, the children can then go and, and learn um, the, 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 the next rules of uh, recitation. So moving on. Um, now let's we will practice Surah Fatiha. So but before Surah Fatiha, I thought, you know, um, because Surah Fatiha is one of those surahs that we recite uh, in every salah. And it's really important for us to, subhanAllah, um, learn the meaning. If not the meaning, we need to understand how special Surah Fatiha is. So th look, this, this hadith I have here, Hazrat Abu Sa'ad, uh, uh, he mentions that, he says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once he was in the masjid, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the masjid with the sahaba. So Hazrat sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that I'll teach you a surah, which is the greatest surah in the Quran before you leave the masjid. Now you need to understand this. The Quran has, subhanAllah, 114 surahs. And here Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that I'm going to teach you a surah, which is the greatest surah in the Quran. You know, that's absolutely amazing. And by the way, saying surah, let me just quickly tell you, um, the word surah with a scene means chapter, right? And the word surah with a sad means picture, right? So can you see how, um, you know, these letters, how important it is that we learn uh, how to pronounce. So sad with a sad surah, picture, image, uh, scene, surah, it, it, it means uh, chapter, so surah. So when we say surah, we, we use seen. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that there's a surah in the Quran, which is the greatest surah. And I'll teach you before I leave the masjid. So this sahabi, he is now um, going out of the masjid. And then he, um, he says that, Ya Rasulullah, did you not say that you would teach me a surah? You know, subhanAllah. So, um, so what did Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took hold of the hand of this sahabi. And then he taught him surah Fatiha. He taught him surah Fatiha. And surah, so... The reason I'm, I've put this hadith is so that, if, because Surah Fatiha, we, subhanAllah, if anyone who doesn't read, you know, like we have the Sunnah Mu'akkada and Sunnah Ghair Mu'akkada, don't we? So you have the Sunnah which you, you know, you have to read them. And then the Sunnah which you should also read them. But if, if a person does miss them out, then the accountability is not as much as missing out a Sunnah Mu'akkada. So if you were to calculate the rakats in Salah, there are altogether 48 uh, rakats of salah that you would read in a day now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from all the surahs of the quran allah chose surah fatiha that you will read surah fatiha in salah right so you can imagine how amazing this surah must be that out of the 114 surah allah could have used allah could have chose surah rahman or you know another surah surah um, surah duha you know surah duha is an absolutely amazing surah so allah could have said when you start your salah after a'udhu billah bismillah you you need to read what duha but nabi sallallahu alaihi instructed us that we should be reading surah fatiha and an individual every day the, the person who reads the bare minimum salah with his sunnah mu'akkada, he reads 20, he reads Surah Fatiha 28 times. So a minimum of 28 to 48 times, we are reading Surah Fatiha in salah. And the sad reality is we've been reading salah for 10 years, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. And till now, maybe we don't know what Surah Fatiha means. Um, and what is the message? And what, what am I asking from Allah in Surah Fatiha? Because we all know Surah Fatiha is actually a dua. It's a very, very special dua. 
So, and this is important that when we start our salah, uh, when we stand in salah and when we are reciting Surah Fatiha, we should, we should keep in mind that I am actually making a dua to Allah. And this is a dua that Allah wants us to make. And this is the reason why, you know, subhanAllah, you know, one of the amazing things is that out of the 114 surahs, you, we all know that the surahs in the Quran are not in the order that they were revealed, right? So Iqra Surah Alaq was the first surah that was revealed, but it's in the 30th juz. Now Surah Fatiha is a surah which out of the 114 surahs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose it to be the first surah in the Quran. And Allah chose that surah for us to recite in Salah. So you got to understand this surah must be really special. And if we really do go into this surah, we would find that this surah is a dua and we're only asking Allah for two things. So when we start the surah and we read, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So again, if you, if you focus on verse one, it's the ha that we need to focus on and the ayn. So, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So, we shouldn't be reading Rabbil Alameen. Rabbil Alameen. Again, I don't want to put you off here, but Alam, Alam means knowledge. Right? Ilm. So, Alam from Alam, we have Ilm, Alim. In the Quran, you have Alim. Allah is Alim, the most knowledgeable. But, Na'uzu Billah, Na'uzu Billah, Allah forbid, if we read Alim with that Hamza, Alim means severe punishment, painful. Alim. Alam, the word alam means uh, painful, right? So we need to be really careful anyway. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So that's the first verse. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rah, again, ha. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Maliki Yawmiddin. So in the third verse, Maliki Yawmiddin, we need to focus on the dal. Now, this is a common mistake which I have found that a lot of people make this mistake. They would read Maliki Yawmid Deen instead of Deen Zin or Zin comes out, right? So I don't know where, you know, maybe it's because we, we learned our Surah Fatiha when we were three years old, right? And at that time, it was difficult for us to pronounce the letter dal, maybe. And then we, we, we didn't bother, you know, going to someone uh, and correcting it. Right, so Maliki Yawmid Deen. It's not Deen or anything, it's Deen. So the first three ayat, we're praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, all praises belong to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Ar-Rahman rahim the most compassionate, but the all merciful. Maliki Yawmid Deen, master of the day of judgment. So the first three verses, so obviously if, we're, um, if, if we go to anyone to ask for, uh, for help, what would we do? We'd first maybe start off by praising them. Uh, saying nice things about them and this is what we're doing here we are praising allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the best possible in the best possible manner i don't want to go into the tafsir of the first three verses then we are expressing our need and we're expressing our weakness to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we're saying that it is only you we worship and we only seek help from you. We can't go to anyone else. No one else can help us. So, So can you see, we've basically now, we're, we're getting ready to ask Allah. Yeah. So we've praised Allah in the first three verses. Then we've, we've expressed our weakness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now we're ready to ask Allah. So this is what Allah wants us to ask him. And this is the greatest dua a person can make that guide us to the straight path. And what is the straight path? The path of those upon whom, uh, whom you conferred favors. Yani the path of the anbiya, the path of the awliya. And Allah save us from being misled and misguided. You know, and save us from being led astray. So, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ So this is what, it's a beautiful dua. Surah Fatiha is actually a dua where, so whenever we stand in salah, we should keep that in mind. That, you know, I'm actually asking Allah, I'm starting off with the first three verses, I am praising Allah. In the fourth verse, I am expressing my weakness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after that, I am actually now begging Allah for guidance and protection from being misguided and misled. So, that's Surah Fatiha done. Um, now let's move on. So we've, we've just focused on one rule. We've, we've, so the first rule is the twin letters. 
So we need to ensure that we pronounce every letter uh, correctly. Then we have the short harakas. The short harakas, subhanAllah, you know, which in our language we would call it Zabar Zair Pesh. And now, you know, with those who study the um, Safar series, uh, they normally call it, the Arabs call it Fatha, Kasra, and Dhamma. And in the, in the Farsi language, I think it's known as Zabar Zair and Pesh. So it's nothing to fight over or nothing to die over. Oh, these law are reading it like this and they're calling it that. No, no, these are just names in different languages. So um, Zabar is Fatha, Zair is Kasra, and Pesh is Dhamma. So the rule is, and it's very simple, the rule. I won't be able to read all of this. The rule is that whenever you come across a Zabar, Zair, Pesh, or Fatha, Kasra, Dhamma, we're not allowed to stretch them. We're not allowed to stretch them. So whether... Um, so, like, I'll give you an example. The, uh, number 13 says, فصائقة. So, obviously, we need to ensure that we're pronouncing every letter properly as well. So, it's not فصائقة, فصائقة, you know. So, maybe um, we would have read فصائقة, um, but now we've learned that the first rule is that we need to ensure that we pronounce every letter correctly. So, فصائقة, فصائقة. So, if I stretch it, and if I say فصائقة, Right, then again, it, it's a problem. Uh, it can change the meaning. I'll give you an example of changing the meaning. For example, you have qala. Qala. The word qala means he said. The word qala. So if you stretch it, like even that much, that qala, it means they said. So look how, how much of a difference. It, it, like, subhanAllah, you just stretch it a little bit and it can actually change the meaning. So we have fasa'iqa. Or Rajilika, Rajilika, or Fafasaqa. So again, we need to ensure that we're pronouncing every letter correctly. And whenever you come across a Zabar Zair or Pesh or Fatha Dhamma Kasra, then we need to ensure that we're not stretching them, especially when it comes to joining uh, uh, sentences. So what we tend to do is, uh, the beginners, what they tend to do is, they wouldn't stretch any letters, but the last letter of the word, because now they're trying to work out the next word, so whilst working out the next word, we're stretching the last letter of every word. So we need to ensure that that's not happening. So that's your um, second rule, which is the short haraka. Then coming to long harakas, um, it's your the, the what we would call um, karizabar karizer and ultipesh, or some people call it kharazabar kharazer ultapesh, or and here we've put it as long harakas. Long harakas again. Whenever you come across a long haraka, then you stretch it. So can you see? We've said that a sh a short harakas we won't stretch. Long harakas we will stretch. So for example, we have na a na a, and then we have qatala. Again, we won't say katala. We'll say qa, qa tala. So we won't stretch the ta, we won't stretch the lam, we will only stretch the qaf. Qa tala, ilahun amana, amana, hadihi. Now, subhanAllah, let me just quickly tell you this, this what, I've, what, I'm, what I've got on the screen, it's taken from the Safar Learn to Read series, the complete qaida. Now, what Safar have done is, uh, Allah give them jazai khair, subhanAllah. Their entire qaida has been put on video where a teacher is actually teaching it. So what you can do is, if you want to work on your tajweed and you're, you don't have the time or you feel shy to go to someone, you shouldn't feel shy because remember the Sahaba, they learned the Quran at an age older than us. So they were older than us when they learned to recite the Quran with tajweed or read the Quran and understand the Quran. So we should never feel shy. We're never too old to learn. Right, so but if you do, and during this, especially during this, um, uh, or why not in the month of Ramadan, you know, go over each one clip, order the book, they'll deliver it, inshallah. And then uh, if I could ask our host, uh, Brother Mubin, to post the links, inshallah, um, and then what we can do is that'll make it easy for all of us, um, inshallah. Then after, maybe after this uh, thingy course, then you could save that link and every day just go over one video and learn um, something new inshallah so that's your long haraka, haraka. so um, for example you've got yarahu yarahu so again ultra pesh which we call ultra pesh you'd, you'd stretch that so moving on then we have the three letters of mud so we've covered two three things we've covered the twin letters we've covered the short harakas we've covered the long harakas and now the letters of mud so what are the letters of mud uh, subhanallah, you know, I was supposed to cover all of this in, I think, 10 minutes or so. 
What are we on? Half an hour. Right? Allahu Akbar. You know, can we have the window open, please? Right, I think I'm going to faint. Subhanallah. Anyways, uh, mud means to stretch. So letters of mud. There are three letters of mud. Now, this is quite complicated, and I won't... If you've never heard of it before, then it might be quite difficult. So you will have to go over this again. Now, Safar do have this on their Qaeda. Um, I'm not expecting to teach this rule, and I'm not expecting anyone to really get, get it straight away. But there are three letters of mud. It's Alif, Ya, and Wow. Or we could call it Alif, Wow, and Ya, whichever. Alif mud is known as a Fatha followed by an Alif. So a Fatha followed by an alif will be stretched I'll, I'll show you the example if you look at the uh, the first um, the first example here ya da wudu ya da wudu so what's happening here is we're stretching ya because it's got a long haraka now with regards to dal it, it has a short haraka on it so we're not supposed to stretch it but the rule here we've said is that a fatha followed by an alif a fatha followed by an alif will be stretched. So if you look on top of dal, we have a fatha there, and it's followed by an alif. So it will be stretched. So we will say ya da wudu, ya da wudu. So this is what we would call an alif mad or an alif madda. Um, ya madda is a kasra followed by a ya sakin. So that will be stretched as well. So a kasra followed by a ya sakin will be stretched. If we look at the next example, we have a, which we won't stretch because that's a short haraka. Then we have ki. Now, normally we would say ki, you won't be, you, you're not supposed to stretch ki. Why? Because it's a short haraka. But it's a kasra followed by a ya sakin. So the rule was, uh, ya madda is a kasra followed by a ya sakin will be stretched. So we have a kasra followed by a yasakin. So we will now stretch it and we will say a ki do. Well, we say do, right? Are we allowed to say do? No, we're not because it's a dhamma. So it's a ki do, a ki do. So the next one is our amina, our amina. Now here we all we have all short harakas. We have a wa amina, awa amina. So if anyone says awa amina or awa amina, right, wrong, right? So next we have salihina, salihina. Again, we can't say salihina. If we say salihina, it'll change the meaning. Actually, it doesn't even have a meaning, salihin, right? Salihina, sa, we're stretching sa because it's a long haraka. We're not allowed to stretch the lamb, so we're saying salih li, and then he he. We're stretching it because it's a ya mad, so it's a kasra followed by a ya sakin. Salihina, and then the last one is your wow mad, which is a dhamma followed by a wow sakin. So when we have a dhamma, which is a fish, and it's followed by a wow sakin, it will be stretched. So do we have any here? Subhanallah. Um, I can't. I can't see one uh, here in this example. But we have a'udhu, a'udhu. So you have a'u. So you know in a'u the ain, it has a dhamma, uh, which ha it has a dhamma followed by a wow sakin. So that's the reason why we would read it a'udhu. So that's your um, alhamdulillah. These are the, the we've just covered four the four core rules. If we can work on these four. And Alhamdulillah, we fulfill the fara'is of tajweed. We fulfill the fara'is of tajweed. So, but if we um, if we lack here, then there's a possibility that we are changing the meaning of the Quran. But let me just tell you one thing, please, and this is important. I remember coming. Uh, I remember someone once said to me that I don't read the Quran because I might change the meaning, right? What, what, you know, I can't read, so why should I try for? Because you know the meaning will change, and I'm going to be sinful. That's not the case. We all know the famous hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha that the one who recites the Quran and struggles whilst reciting the Quran, then lahu ajran. Aisha radiallahu anha says that for him or for her will be double the reward. One for reading the Quran and one for trying. One for, sorry, one for reading the Quran and one for struggling. So the individual who struggles and still yet continues reading will, will receive double the reward. But that 
it all depends if, if we need to obviously then put our time into learning the Tajweed rules. And like I said, you know, there are four core rules. So don't get scared. Don't think, oh my God, I need to enroll into a Tajweed course and it's going to be a three years course. No, no, no. Even if you could get these four core Tajweed rules done, Alhamdulillah. Then after that, yes, go on to level two, go on to level three and learn the non-core and beautify the Quran. Anyways, now... Um, now that we've covered the Tajweed rules, how much how much time have I just taken? 35 minutes, subhanAllah. So I'm really bad with my timing. So Bismillah. Just have some tea, please. Anyways, Surah Feel now. So this is a famous surah, subhanAllah. We all um, Alhamdulillah, we all must know Surah Feel off by heart. You know, we, we memorized it when we were in Maktab, uh, got the beats for it. Alhamdulillah. Um, so now we're all reading Surah Feel. Maybe some of you read it in, in uh, Maghrib, right? So when we're reciting Surah Feel, um, what are we saying? What are we reading? What is the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to give, wants us to take um, when we're reciting uh, Surah Feel? Or whether we know the meaning of Surah Feel or not, when reciting it, what, what is it that we can keep? What is it that we can have in our heart? So this is what we want to learn first. So Surah Feel, Feel obviously we all know it means the elephant. We already know the incident of the elephants. Um, so we're not really going to go into that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah highlights the incident of the elephants. So we all know 50 days before the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa a very famous incident uh, took place where the Abraha came marching with his elephants and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the elephants. Allah mentions that in the in the in the surah and here what Allah does is, is that because it's a Makki surah it's a surah that was revealed in Makkah right so Allah is reminding the people of Makkah of his favors that you know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored them by protecting the house of Allah and by protecting them from the army of Abraha and Allah also displays his power to mankind that how did Allah destroy the elephants were they um, how did he destroy them? Allah says in the Quran that, uh, you know, وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلْ تَرْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِّنْ سِجِّيلٍ that, وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلْ And Allah sent, unleashed against them. Allah, you know, flights of birds, subhanAllah. طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلْ تَرْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِّنْ سِجِّيلٍ Who pelted them with clay pebbles, with small, small pebbles. So how did Allah destroy the army of Abraha, the elephants, from small pebbles? So this surah, when we recite this surah, it should really remind us of, you know, we should try and remember some form of calamity that came, became, uh, came upon us and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took us out from that. So sometimes we fall ill, sometimes we're in a lot of trouble and then Allah removes that uh, calamity, removes that problem from us and, and then we forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done this favor upon us, right? So what this surah, the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning this in, entire incident in this surah is to remind the people of Makkah that Allah had, uh, do, Allah had done a great favor upon them. And not only that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also wants them to know how powerful Allah is, that Allah destroyed the, the, the elephants through what? Min sijil, hijara, min sijil, clay pebbles. So for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing is difficult. SubhanAllah, look at this, subhanAllah, the coronavirus. They say that, you know, you have um, within, a, within a, what is it, a nib, uh, the tip of a needle, you could put over 50,000 uh, bacteria, of coronavirus in, in, in the tip of a needle, SubhanAllah. So uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing is difficult. And when we're reciting this surah, um, that's what we are supposed to keep in mind that Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-feel Alam tara kayfa fa'ala kayfa fa'ala So again the ayn is there So Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-feel That sad is there, the ha is there Bi ashab al-feel And Allah is saying Alam tara, have you not seen Kayfa fa'ala rabbuka That how your rab dealt with be ashab al feel with the people of the elephants. Alam yaj'al kaydahum fi tadlil. That did he not lay their plants to waste? 
Did he not destroy them? وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلٍ And sent against them flights of birds that تَرْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِّنْ سِجِّيلٍ Who pelted them with clay pebbles. And what happened to them? فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَسْفٍ مَأْكُولٍ فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَسْفٍ مَأْكُولٍ That making them look like eaten fodder. Subhanallah. So that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, destroyed the army of Abraha. So this is a surah which really it, it reminds us of the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it also should make us feel guilty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has you know, favored us. And despite all his favors, uh, when, when, when he favors us, we should be turning towards him. But we forget and we then, subhanallah, spend our lives as though uh, Allah hasn't done any favors upon us. So that's um, Surah Feel, everyone. And then we have Surah Quraysh. Uh, so again, that is um, Quraysh, we all know its na the, the name of the tribe of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this surah was revealed in Mecca. It has four uh, verses. And again, the same thing is happening here. In, in Surah Feel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was speaking to the Meccans. And this surah is specifically to the Quraysh. Now, you, you, you need to understand that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to a specific group of people, we can still derive lessons from that for ourselves. So we shouldn't be like, oh, yeah, this surah is for the Quraysh, so then why should, how would this surah benefit us? No. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, says something to a specific individual or group of people in the Quran, it is also referring to us and we should also take lessons from it. So Surah Quraysh, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, in this surah mentions the special favors that Allah had done upon the Quraysh. Quraysh were classed as very special people. They were very special people. And in them days, we know that when they used to travel, because they never had the goods in Makkah Mukarramah, so whenever they had to buy stuff, they would have to go out outside or to the outskirts of Makkah or to go to Syria, Sham, uh, uh, the greatest Syria, which we would call. Um, and they would have to buy merchandise from there and return it back to Makkah and sell. So what would happen is if any other tribe was to travel, in them days, if any other tribe was to travel, they would be looted, they'd be attacked, they would be robbed on the way. But the Quraysh, they were so special, Allah gave them that, that Allah gave them that honor. That they were so special in the sight of people that whenever they would travel, whether it be during the winter season or the summer season, no one would attack their caravan. So Allah is now reminding them in this surah, Allah reminds the Quraysh of this special favor. And by reminding them, Allah says, then So if you know, if Allah has given you this honor because you look after the Kaaba, because the Quraysh had the honor of looking after the Kaaba, so no one would really do anything to them because they would say, oh, these are the people of the Kaaba. So Allah is saying that if, if people class you as the people of the Kaaba and they don't harm you, then you should worship the Lord of the Kaaba. Yeah? He is the one. He is the one who feeds you during your hunger. And he keeps you safe from fear, right? So normally people uh, have a lot of fear when they travel uh, with their wealth. But you were completely safe. So you should worship the Lord of this house who gave you this safety, who gave you this security. So nevertheless, so when reciting this surah, again, subhanAllah, we need to remind ourselves of the favors which Allah has bestowed upon us, right? Now we're in England, for example, we live in the UK. Allahu Akbar. Imagine... We were, we, were in, uh, we were in Pakistan or we were living in Bangladesh or we were living in, in India, right? And this coronavirus and this lockdown was to happen. What would be our state? SubhanAllah, we would be in need of aid. We would be in need of people's zakat. We would be in need of people sending food parcels to us. But is that the case? You come to people's house, SubhanAllah, the fridge is full. Right? So these are, we need to remind ourselves of the blessings, the favors which Allah has bestowed upon us. And then that should, allow, that should then turn us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is Surah Quraysh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Li la fi Quraysh. That, just a minute, please. Uh, okay. So we have Li la fi Quraysh. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, because of the security enjoyed by the Quraysh, that their familiarity with traveling in winter and summer, where Allah made it easy for them to travel in shita and saif. Saif, again, can you see saif? I said weather, but it's actually summer. So if you say was saif, 
then you've just changed the meaning to um, a, a, a sword, right? So, and then, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, because of the security that they enjoy, what should they do? فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ So they should worship the Lord of this house, right? الَّذِي أَتُعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوءُ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفُ Who fed them in hunger, وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفُ And gave them safety from fear. So whenever we read الَّذِي Now الَّذِي is a word that keeps on coming in the Quran. But again, a lot of people, subhanAllah, this is a common mistake that we read الَّذِي الَّذِي no, it's not Allah Z, it's Allah Z, the, right? So this is something which we need to um, uh, bear in mind, inshallah. So that's, we've, we've covered Surah Feel and Surah Quraysh. I think we'll give you a little breather, isn't it? Now, and give me a little breather as well. Isn't that okay, uh, Mubin, uh, Brother Mubin? Ji, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Do you want to take over now? Do you want to deliver the, the rest of the... Uh... Astaghfirullah, we'll just let you have a small tea break, inshallah, because there's a lot to cover. But just as a reminder to all our... Um, guests inshallah if you do have any questions um, on the chat we've shared a link where you can ask any questions relating to taraweeh or any other questions inshallah we will try our best to answer them um, towards the end of the program as Imam Saab mentioned uh, Mufti Dilwar Saab will be taking over the rest of the slides and can also answer any of the questions that you may have but alhamdulillah we've covered um, a lot of the four key rules of Tajweed as you have noticed um, we have shared the link of the Qaeda practice that you may do on the chat. Um, and inshallah, if you do bear with us, we, we should be able to get through um, the majority of the slides. Make dua that Allah grants us barakah in our time, inshallah. Um, so I'll now um, kindly hand over back to our Imam Saab. I think he's having some tea, inshallah. So over to you, Imam Saab, to go over the rest of the surahs, inshallah. As well, I thought I'd get five minutes there, but tell alhamdulillah. Okay, surah Ma'un now. Um, subhanallah. Um, uh, this surah again, it, Ma'un, uh, Sundries, um, we all know what, what that is basic um, um, things that we have in our homes uh, which have not, which don't have much of, of a significance. Uh, so that's what this, that's what Ma'un means. And this surah again, it was revealed in Makkah. Um, it has seven verses. So let's go into it, inshallah. Surah Ma'un again, Ara'ayta alladhi yukadhibu biddin, fadhalika alladhi yadu'u al-yateem. وَلَا يَحُضُّ عَلَىٰ تُعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ Now again, uh, you know this فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ I'm not sure, our Ustad, I can still remember our Khari Mushtaq, so please everyone make dua for um, our Ustad who we studied uh, the Saba Qirat from uh, the seven different ways of reciting the Qur'an. Um, our Ustad is very ill. Um, so Allah Ta'ala grant our Ustad um, Shifa, Shifa Kamila, Ajila Mustamira Daima. So our Ustad um, used to really get angry when anyone in Salah would, you would stop at Fawailul Lil Musallin. Um, you would say, no, you can't say Fawailul Lil Musallin. You have to say Fawailul Lil Musallin al Hum An Salati Him Sahun. Because Fawailul Lil Musallin means destruction be for those who perform their Salah. So can you see how serious that is? So in reality, it's not fawailul lil musallin. And on top of that, that circle, you can see they have a lam, alif, which means la, la taqif. Don't stop here. Fawailul lil musallin al hum an salatihim sahun. That destruction be for those performers of salah who al hum an salatihim sahun who neglect to perform their salah. So that's, that's the full sentence. Nevertheless, this surah, again, subhanAllah, um, it, it's revealed. So we have, Ara'ayta alladhi yukadhibu biddin. So Allah says, Ara'ayta alladhi, hmm? have you not seen the person who yukadhibu biddin, who denies the day of reckoning, right? So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing here is Allah is giving us, uh, Allah is uh, informing us of some of the qualities of those individuals or a certain individual who doesn't who didn't used to believe in the day of judgment so now we, we would look at it as an umum here we would look at it that those who do not believe in the day of judgment there is a possibility that they may have these traits so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning five traits here right the first one is uh, that the, the one who um, does not believe in the because you see qiyamah and the day of reckoning uh, subhanallah, one who is always conscious that I need to stand in front of Allah one day and I will need to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one day. So that individual, 
you know, subhanAllah, just having the Iman bil, bil akhirah or Iman on Yawmul Qiyamah, what it does is it, it prevents an individual from sinning and it also helps an individual from doing dhulm, uh, uh, basically stops an individual from doing dhulm or, or, or oppressing uh, people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions five qualities that Ra'ita alladhi yukadhibu bid-deen. You know, have you not seen that individual who rejects the day of reckoning? فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِيمِ So that's the first quality. فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِيمِ وَلَا يَحُضُّ عَلَى تُعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ Second quality. فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ Third quality. الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاءُونَ Fourth quality. وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَاعُونَ And that's the fifth quality. So the first quality... Um, so, رَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينَ فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِيمِ That he pushes away, pushes the orphans away. Right? فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِيمِ وَلَا يَحُضُّ عَلَى تُعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ And nor does he encourage others to help the needy. So there is a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is specifically mentioning these. Although those who don't believe in the day of reckoning, they do even more. Than that, but Allah is highlighting these five because the, this this surah was revealed um, regarding a certain individual, right? But we're not going to go into the tafsir of this surah now. So the so the third one is فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ that he neglects to perform the salah or to to worship Allah subhanahu wa taala, and then الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاعُونَ if he does perform salah or if he does do any acts of worship, then he does it for fame. Right, he does it to show people it's out of ostent ostentation, right? And then for that they refuse to help others with common items, right? And this is again, uh, this is again referring back to ma'un that common items of use, which is, for example, like if like anything that we have in our house which doesn't really cost as much. Right, and if if a neighbor now, obviously in this day and age, people don't really come. I can still remember um, uh, back in the days when uh, our neighbors used to actually knock on our door and say, "Oh, can, you know, mum's asking, do you have any onions? Um, can we have some onions or can we have some potatoes?" Now, you know, the society and community has changed. But back in the days, I can still remember, you know, neighbors would actually knock on and would ask for certain things, and that's what used to happen at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well. That there were certain items which were known as ma'un sundries, which were your common items of use. So wayamnaun al ma'un, the person who rejects the day of reckoning, one of his qualities is he's so miserly or she is so miserly that they will not even give or help by giving someone the common items of use, which is ma'un. So these are. Five qualities which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions in this surah. And our belief obviously in the hereafter needs to be strengthened. So when we recite this surah, subhanAllah, um, we need to remind ourselves of these, of these five qualities. And we need to also understand that the, the, most, the stronger our belief is on the day of judgment, then the less sins we will commit. And this is important. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in many ahadiths, whenever he would advise someone, he would say, "Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir." Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir. Man kana yu'minu. He would say, he would want to give an advice, but he would say, "The one who believes in Allah and on the day of judgment, then he should do this, or then he shouldn't do this." So the reason Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to reiterate that, and the reason he would mention that again and again is, it was just so that. Our belief in Allah and our belief in the day of judgment will inshallah prevent us from doing many um, uh, vices and many evil things. So we need to then, whenever we recite the, this surah, uh, we need to remind ourselves of um, these um, qualities or these evil traits which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned. That, Ara'ita alladhi yukadhibu bid-deen. Have you not seen the person who denies the day of reckoning? فَذَٰلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِيمِ He is the one who pushes away the orphan, right? Instead of caring for the orphans, he pushes them away. وَلَا يَحُضُّ عَلَىٰ تُعَامِ الْمِسْكِينِ And he is the one who doesn't encourage feeding the poor. So never mind feeding the poor, he doesn't even encourage people to feed the poor. And then Allah says, so that's the second quality. The third quality, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ Right? For the destruction be for those performers of salah 
who neglect their salah. And Allah uh, protect us all. You know, Allah forgive us all. Uh, Allah protect us from coming under this category where we are neglecting our salah. And I don't want to, again, I don't want to start another bayan on the importance of salah or else, you know, we're going to be here till 12. So, and then, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the, the, the fourth quality, which is, الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاعُونَ and they are those who, um, when they do do any good deeds, so subhanAllah, uh, they are ostentatious. So um, this is something which we really, subhanAllah, need to save ourselves from. That, you know, someone just recently said, when you, when you give to the poor, then leave your camera at home. And, you know, especially now with uh, what's going on, this is a, an advice to myself and each and every one of us, that, you know, there's a lot of act of kindness that is going on. Yes, you know, maybe sometimes for our uh, organizational purpose, you know, we, we want to show that we've done this and we've done that. But we need to really take it easy on that because sometimes even while showing that as an organization we've done this, it can then hit our ikhlas and we can then fall under yura'oon, right? This is why I can still remember some long time ago when we first uh, started doing certain things, we used to post on Facebook, right? And then it really, subhanAllah, once I, I asked myself that, you know, then, then what happened was it started off with ikhlas that, oh yeah, we'll, we'll let people know so then people can also do it. But sometimes you can also be driven. And this is why Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, he mentions that there are certain form of riya and ostentation which an individual himself doesn't even know that he's committing riya. So riya is to do acts for the sake of fame or for people to say good things about us or so people to praise us. So on the day of judgment, three groups of people will be called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will come to Allah, uh, the Qari, the, the, the Alim, and the Mujahid, the Sakhi, the, the one who was very generous. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the individual will say, oh, I spent so much money in your path. And one individual will say, I gave my life in your path. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, well, you did it for people and you did it for their wahwa. You know, you did it for, so that people can say, wow, and people can say, mashallah, look how generous they are. Mashallah, look how nice these individuals are. Or look how good this person is and how good their organization is. You did it for that and you got it. So now today, go and get the reward from them. So that's the last thing we want to do. We don't want our deeds to be spoiled. So we need to really work on ikhlas, attaining ikhlas. It is very difficult, but it's something that we really need to work towards. Ikhlas doesn't just come like that. Ikhlas requires a lot of work. And this is why the, the Sufis, they say that the last trait, the last good character to come in a person is ikhlas. So after attaining all the beautiful characteristics, the beautiful character traits, the last one to come into a person is ikhlas. Ikhlas doesn't come first. Ikhlas comes right at the end. But nevertheless, again, I've started another bayan. I'm sorry. Allah says, and the, the fifth quality, and he is the one who refuses even minor articles, you know, things which are common use, that, that individual also um, refuses them. So that's Surah Ma'un. Whenever we recite Surah Ma'un, we should remind ourselves that again, if my Iman on Akhirah, and if my Iman on the Day of Judgment is weak, then... Um, then I will commit sins. And this is why whenever we read this surah, it should increase our iman on the day of judgment. We should sometimes, like our, our elders, they say that take, take a few minutes out in a day and remind yourself that one day I will leave this world. One day I will be in the grave. One day I will be asked in the grave that these questions will be asked to me in the grave. I will have to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything I've done. Right? So when we do that, what happens is it reminds us of the Akhirah, then our Iman on Akhirah will be strong, which will then prevent us from um, having these qualities or any other qualities. So moving on, inshallah, um, the next surah is Surah Kawthar. Now again, Allahu Akbar, Surah Kawthar is actually a very um, sad, it's actually a, it's a, it's a beautiful surah, it's the shortest surah in the Quran. Surah Kawthar, it only has three verses, Allahu Akbar. Maybe for some of us, it was the first surah that we even memorized. Or maybe Surah, surah uh, Ikhlas was the first, or one of the first surahs that we've memorized. But Surah Kawthar, subhanAllah, is an absolutely amazing surah. Because when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of his sons passed away, and we know that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, all his um, sons passed away during his lifetime, uh, even his daughters, apart from Azad Fatima radiallahu anha. So, you know, whenever we uh, face difficulties in our lives, uh, our teachers used to say that, read the seerah. 
because when you when you study the seerah what happens is it consoles you it gives you that uh, itminan and you feel that subhanallah even uh, the nabi of allah went through difficulties even the nabi of allah lost his children so when one of the child of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away these people were really evil you know the people of makkah you know and when people are evil to you and when they really hurt you 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 should see the life of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam that even he went through that that even your enemies you know subhanallah even if you hate someone right you shouldn't be hating anyone but if you hate someone and you find out that their parents or someone passed away in their family you feel sorry for them right you feel sorry for them the people of makkah were so evil to nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam that when they heard that nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam son has passed away they instead of consoling him they mocked him nauzubillah they mocked him and they there was this really um there was this bad word that they used to use and it was known as abtar abtar is basically when, a, when an individual when if you have an animal where the animal's tail is cut off right so they normally use the word abtar for that animal right so they use that for nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying that his nasal is cut off nauzubillah which means that um, he has no children so abu jahal would say to his friends that look why are you worried about muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam for you don't need to be worried about him he's got no he's got no one so when he passes away after a few years everything will be gone no one will talk about him because he has no sons to carry out his progeny and he, you know to carry out his um, progeny so this is when subhanallah this is the love that allah has for his nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to console his nabi allah revealed this surah surah kausar sorry not surah kausar surah kautsar right subhanallah right, can you imagine uh, teaching a tajweed course and then making a tajweed mistake la hawla wala quwwata illa i'm i'm tired that's why right okay bismillah rahman rahim allahu akbar kabira Anyway, so Surah Kawthar was revealed to console our beloved Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and in that, Allah subhanahu wa taala does two things. Inna a'tayna kal Kawthar, Allahu Akbar. It's an absolutely amazing surah, such a short surah. But imagine how happy Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam would have been when he, when these surahs were revealed, because Kawthar. Um, some some scholars, uh, uh, some mufassirun have mentioned that Kawthar, and we've heard Kawthar before. Right, is Kawthar is referring to the spiritual fountain, you know, which is in Jannah. And uh, on the day of judgment, Subhanallah, you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam will be standing next to the well of Kawthar, and people will be coming to Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam in flocks to drink the water of Kawthar. And, and we all know from the hadith that a sip from Kawthar will take away the thirst of an individual, and an individual will never be thirsty again. So. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here what Allah is doing is that these individuals they are mocking Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam that oh don't worry no one you know no one will talk about him and Allah is saying no 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 that's not the case inna a'tayna kal kawthar verily we have granted you kawthar and the, the the literal translation of kawthar is abundant goodness uh, you know khair kathir they call it and so every goodness that allah gave to nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam will also come under the word kawthar right so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is is informing nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he will be granted the the ownership of the well of kawthar which you know millions of his ummati will come to drink and his ummati are his spiritual children which we call ruhani aulad so even if nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam had no sons who were remaining he has all these ruhani spiritual children who will come to him on the day of judgment and you know subhanallah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna a'tayna kal kawthar we have granted you kawthar and right at the end of allah says inna shani aka huwa al abtar you know these guys who are saying that um you know um these lot who are saying about uh, the, they're mocking you and they're calling you abtar no 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 indeed it is your enemy who shall be unknown they are the ones who are the abtars right and subhanallah if we look at it today um the abu jahal uh, is the one who used to call nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam abtar and if we look does he have a lineage does he have anyone uh, from his family who is alive whereas when we look at the 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 lineage of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when we look at the ummati or uh, ummatis of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam the whole world is filled with the ummatis of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam so this is a surah which allah consoles nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam by mentioning that we have given you al kawthar Uh, we have granted you al kawthar and therefore since we have granted you kawthar 
fasalli li rabbika wanhar fasalli li rabbika wanhar as a token of gratitude as a token of appreciation you should do two things one is fasalli li rabbik perform salah to your rabb and wanhar and do qurbani in allah's name so allah again here is uh, once again allah is mentioning the blessings and after the blessings allah has also mentioned that that be grateful by performing salah and by doing qurbani so subhanallah you know whenever in in our lives uh, whenever we we go through a downfall or if anyone's going through problems in their lives the way to console them is by reminding them of what they have and this is what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done here that allah is nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam was human and nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to be used to get really hurt when people would say things about him and you could imagine losing a child will make you sad anyway allahu akbar and then on top these individuals used to mock would mock nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam at that difficult time so how has allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, consoled his nabi he, by mentioning the favors that nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam has received and this is a beautiful way to kind of when an individual is going through difficulties in their lives and if we are there to help them then what we can do is remind them of what they have remind them of what they've been blessed with because there are people who haven't been blessed with what they've been blessed with so when when an individual looks at that then it will inshallah ease their uh, difficulties so that's surah kawthar whenever we recite it um, it should remind us that our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was also abused by his haters so if if we do have haters and if we do have problems and issues and people are uh, all these islamophobia it really at one time i used to wake up in the morning and the first thing i would do is uh, read the newspaper or read the news sorry right and then it, it started really hurting me and my life became like miserable that there are so many people who are saying bad things about islam and and so i stopped reading the news right but then when when you read when you read this surah subhanallah and when you see that even the nabi of allah was attacked and he was abused by his haters then that gives you that peace in the in your heart that look um, it doesn't matter what you say right because you know even our nabi went through this and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoled him so that will in itself is a consolement for us so that surah kawthar then moving on we have surah kafirun again subhanallah this surah is actually a, a very uh, it's an amazing surah subhanallah um because obviously you know the bisab allah sam started calling people towards allah and while calling people towards allah he would have to inform people that these idols they are they are of no use right so what happened the people of makkah they they got kind of frustrated so initially they came and we all know the incident that they uh, they sent abu talib and they they said uh, that, that that inform your nephew that if he needs wealth then we will give him all the wealth if he wants uh, you know if he wants uh, to 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 get married then we will get him married to the most beautiful woman of makkah uh, you know all of this so the answer the reply that nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave was that oh my uncle if you were to place the the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand then even then you will not be able to stop me from preaching the deen of allah right so when the when the people of makkah when they when they they realize you know what it's not going to work with him so they wanted to kind of come to some terms and negotiate subhanallah right so what was their negotiation they came to nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they said to nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay you know what what we'll do is we will worship your lord for one year right and you worship our idols for one year what do you think right does that sound good right so nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't say anything then after that they thought you know what it's not going to work here so they came back and they said okay then um you will do this that will um I, i can't fully sorry i'm um, i'm 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 kind of forgetting uh, the tafsir here so they they sent another proposal and then nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam rejected that as well he didn't reply to that and then the third one and you can imagine how desperate these people were they said okay then we will will we'll, you know um you don't need to do anything but just touch touch the feet of our idols touch the feet of our idols meaning that was a form of respect just show respect to our idols and that's when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanallah uh, revealed these verses and again they were revealed in makkah they have six verses allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed these verses qul ya ayyuhal kafirun and again qul remember qul that say o kafirun all the ones who are rejecting la a'budu ma ta'budun right i am a muslim and i am i am a mu'min la a'budu i do not worship those things that you worship ma ta'budun 
Right? I do not worship those things that you worship. Wala antum abiduna ma abud, and nor do you worship what I worship. Yeah. So look, this is what it is. It's, it's how it is. I don't worship what you worship. La abudu ma taabudun. Wala antum abiduna ma abud. You don't worship what I worship. And guess what? You're talking about the future. Do this. Do that. Wala ana abidun ma abatum. And neither am I going to worship what you worship. Right? Wala antum abiduna ma abud. And forget it. You know what? You don't need to worship. And nor are you going to worship what I worship lakum dinukum waliya din for you is is your religion yeah if you're going to re refuse it then you know what you take your religion and for me is my religion right so you know i'm not gonna so here nabi sallallahu alaihi has taught us a very 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 important lesson that when it comes to the fundamentals of our deen when it comes to uh, the aqaid and when it comes to the fundamentals of our deen then there is no compromise whatsoever we're not allowed to compromise. So when it comes to the fundamentals, yes, there are those things which they're not classed as fundamentals, then we can look into it, yeah? We can look into, okay, what can we do to make things work? But when it comes to fundamentals, our aqaid, our iman, right? Salah is fundamental, right? Salah, zakat is fundamental, hajj is fundamental. When it comes to fundamentals of our deen, right? There is no compromise whatsoever so this is the lesson and subhanallah if you all you would all know that nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam he loved this surah so much right surah kafirun and surah ikhlas these were two surahs that before sleeping nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam the the two rakats that he would read he would read these two surahs surah kafirun surah ikhlas when waking up the first two surahs the first when nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam would start his tahajjud he would read these two surahs Surah Kafirun, Surah Ikhlas. In Fajr Sunnah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would read Surah Kafirun, Surah Ikhlas. In Witr, right? Sabbi Hisma Rabbika Al-A'la in the first rakat, then Surah Kafirun in the second rakat, Surah Ikhlas in the third rakat. So the reason Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would continuously read these surahs was to show that, look, there is no compromise whatsoever. No compromise when it comes to fundamentals of our deen. And this is what we are supposed to keep in mind as well when reciting uh, this surah. So that was Surah Kafirun. Then we have Surah Nasr. SubhanAllah, I think I have two minutes left. My colleague Mufti Dilwar is supposed to be coming on now. Um, but Surah Nasr, what, how many surahs have I covered? Four. Oh, Akbar. Or five. Surah Nasr, again, Surah Nasr is the surah which was revealed in Medina Munawwara. Right, we all know it was the final, the last surah to be revealed upon Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So you can imagine the the advice that is given in this surah is to Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam specifically uh, to do some form of good, some actions. What is that? So Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Ida ja an nasrullahi wal fat," that when Allah's help to the Muslims comes and the victory comes, then wara an wara aitan nasa yadhuluna fi din Allahi afwaja. And you see people entering the deen of Allah in droves, subhanAllah, in large numbers. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically informing Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that when Nasrullah comes, when Fath comes, and when you see that people are entering into the deen of Allah in, in, in massive uh, groups and gatherings, and this is what happened after the ninth year after Hajj, um, after, sorry, after the ninth year of Hijri, yes, um, after Hajjatul Wida, the amount of people that attend uh, from food, sorry, congregations, jama'at would come in hundreds and they would come and accept Islam at the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that when you see this, then start doing one thing. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ So three things, sorry. فَسَبِّحْ دُو تَسْبِيْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكْ تَحْمِيد so read subhanallah, read alhamdulillah, wastaghfir and read istighfar, astaghfirullah, innahu kana tawwaba. When these surahs were revealed and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa recited this surah, some of the sahaba, they were very happy that, oh, this is a glad tiding, that Allah's help is going to come and that victory will come and people will enter into Islam into flocks, in flocks. But there was one sahabi who cried and cried and he wept. And Allahu Akbar, that was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he was sitting next to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he understood this message. That here Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is saying that when your mission is accomplished, and when you have accomplished your mission, then now you need to start doing tasbih, 
tahmid and istighfar basically now completely turned to Allah subhanahu wa Although he was already turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanallah. But now completely turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do these tahmeed, tasbih. Why? Because your time is now close, right? So this is also again another surah that whenever we read this surah, um, this surah kind of is, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has a very important message for those individuals who subhanallah have gone past that period of their lives where all their, you know, the important aspects of their life, for example, um, you know, getting married, you know, and then having, having children and then getting your children married off. And then after that, you know, there, there, there comes a stage in your life where you feel like I've accomplished everything, right? And when that stage comes, then فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ And that's why, you know, a lot of our um, scholars, um, they, after a certain age where they would kind of not retire, subhanAllah, not retire, they would retire to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they would completely, and the reason I have this picture of Medina Munawwara and Jannatul Baqi is this is this should be our like some of our scholars, subhanAllah, they had this hope that you know what, when I reach a certain age, then I want to go to Medina and live there. Why? So that I could die in Medina Munawwara. And we have, like, for example, as a Sheikh Zakaria Rahmatullahi alayhi, who is the, the, the compiler of Fazail Ramadan, Fazail uh, Fazail al Amal. You know, which the kitab that I've been mentioning uh, for the past few few lessons that we should all start doing the ta'aleem of, inshallah. But Shaykh, as a Shaykh, that was his wish. That, you know, he was a great mufassir. He, he wrote so many books and he, he taught so much and the khidmat that he did in, in India, subhanAllah. But after all of that, his hope was that when, you know, a time would come where he needs to retire now and go and live in Medina Munawwara. And that is exactly what happened. And subhanAllah, Shaykh is, as a Shaykh is buried in uh, Jannatul Baqi next to Imam Malik Rahmatullahi Alayhi. So this is something which we all should have the intention of as well, that, you know, um, if I do live, and if I do, um, then I want that period in my life where I could dedicate my entire life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to the TV and not to the internet. Right? These are things which we really, when an individual becomes old, they should kind of cut off from everything. And then it should just be him and Allah, her and Allah. So that's what this surah uh, teaches us. Then moving on, Surah Lahab, again, Allahu Akbar, this is a surah, you know, I could like spend two, three hours on this surah. You know, when I, when I studied the tafsir of this surah, wallah, it amazed me. Um, surah Lahab, it's also, also known as surah, surah Masad, yeah? Lahab means the flaming fire. Now, Lahab, we all know the name of uh, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Abu Lahab, Abu Lahab. Now, his, his actual name wasn't Abu Lahab, it was Umar ibn al-Hisham. Umar ibn al-Husham, Umar, the son of Hisham. But they used to call him Abu Lahab because he was so beautiful that when he was born, he, he, had, this, he had red, rosy cheeks, whatever you want to call it, right? So they called him Lahab because they, they looked like flaming fire, his face, you know? So, you know, well, his beauty didn't really help him, did it? Because um, he, he never used to use his brain. So this individual, Allahu Akbar, he... Nabi, he had two sons who Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's daughter as a Zainab radiallahu anha and uh, Ruqayya radiallahu anha were engaged to these uh, two sons and you know um, we all know the incident and we have a picture here of Safa and the reason we've put that picture is um, this is Safa Marwa, you have Safa Marwa and after three years when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the first three years were secret calling people to Islam secretly uh, uh, privately and then after three years, he was ordered that uh, now you need to openly and publicly uh, call people to Islam. And that's when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, he went to Safa. And we all know the incident that happened there. That he stood on Safa and he said, oh, the people of Mecca, um, uh, you know, and we all know the incident. And Abu Lahab at that time, he was the individual. He, he could have stayed quiet. Like one is disagreeing and one is openly mocking the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called everyone, they all came. And this was, you know, during a very busy period. And when they came, they all listened. Whether they agreed or disagreed, they all went. But Abu Lahab was the one who said, Tabballak, Tabballak, that may you be destroyed. Alihada jama'atana. Alihada. You know, have you gathered us for this? Sa'ir al yawm You've you wasted our entire day. So when he said this, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't say anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to refute Abu Lahab, 
Allah revealed these verses and this surah that tabbat yada abi lahabi watab. How dare he say to my Nabi tabbalak? So Allah revealed this surah and the entire ummah and the Muslim ummah will say tabbat yada abi lahabi watab till the day of judgment. That they, they because Abu Lahab said tabbalak to Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam that may you be cursed now, Zubillah. So now the entire ummah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will say, no, tabbat yada abi lahabi wa tabda, may, the, may the hands of Abu Lahab be cursed. And the reason why the Mufassirin mentioned that, why Allah mentions the hands of Abu Lahab, because Abu Lahab was that individual that the Sahaba, one Sahabi says, that I can still remember the initial days of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he would go to the marketplaces and he would call people, he would say, Ya Yuhannas, that tashhadu, Ya Yuhannas, say the shahada, tuflihu, you will be, you will be successful, right? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to go in the marketplace and he would call people towards Allah and there would be an individual behind him who would throw stones at him. And that was Abu Lahab. And the reason he used to throw stones with his hands, that's why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said that may the hands of Abu Lahab be perished. So tabbat yada abi lahabi watab. And Abu Lahab was so arrogant. Allah, Allah gave him so much wealth and he had a lot of children. So he used to say, you know what? Um, so what? You know, so what? Yeah. Um, well, if I do die and if I do go to hell, what I'll do is I'll just pay it off. You know, I'll free myself with all the wealth that I have. Right? Oh, you know what? I'll actually give my sons. My, my sons will protect me. Or I'll send my sons to Jahannam. So that's what he said. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did, subhanallah, during his lifetime, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed the people, him as well as the people, that no, you are completely useless. Your wealth wouldn't help you, nor will your children help you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him this disease. Allah protect us all. Now, subhanAllah, now we're seeing with the coronavirus, there are people who are going in front of, they're not going to, their, to meet their families, yeah, their, their own family members, subhanAllah. Now, obviously, I'm not, I'm not encouraging anyone to, to go and meet their family members, but I'm just saying that Abu Lahab was given such a disease that his entire family abandoned him. So they threw him out of the house, right? And then he died due to that. When he died, no one was willing to even go and bury his body, right? And obviously in Arabia, you can imagine the stench. The stench. So what happened was um, he, um, the, the, then the people started to complain that, you know, why, you know, to Abu Lahab's children that, what are you doing? Why don't you go and bury your father? So what they did was they paid some uh, Habshi Gulams, you know, uh, the Ethiopian and Af slaves. They paid them that go and dig a ditch, not a grave, dig a ditch and then place him into that ditch. So how they placed him into that ditch was they used a wood to scrape his body and they threw him into that ditch. Then they filled the ditch with stones. And then after that, they filled it with soil. So this is how this was. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in the second verse. That ma aghna anhu ma luhu wa ma kasab. That nor did his wealth, nor what he earned, shall, nothing shall benefit him. And, and here the, the Mufassirun have mentioned ma luhu wa ma kasab. Kasab is referring to uh, his children. Right? So, ma agna anhu ma luhu wa ma kasab, that neither his wealth nor the things that he earned, referring to his children, will, will be able to help him. And they didn't help him. Never mind helping him in the akhirah, they didn't even help him in the dunya. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, naran lahab. So, what will happen to this individual? He shall soon enter the flaming fire. Wamra'atuha, not only him, by the way, his supporter. And who was his supporter? It was his wife. And she was known as Umm Jamil, you know, the auntie of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allahu Akbar Kabira. This woman was so evil, she used to place thorns and, and rubbish in the path of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you can imagine how great our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, that one day this woman, she, 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 you know, there was no thorns in the path of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, you know, for the, next, for the past two, three days, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't find any rubbish. So then he asked the people that, you know, this woman, she used to place thorns in my path and in rubbish. Where is she? You know, is, is everything okay that there's nothing here? So then the people told Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that she's not well. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to visit her. Allah Akbar. So this is the akhlaq of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he would be good to those who were evil to him. So nevertheless, this woman, she had this really ex expensive necklace. Uh, so what she did was she sold this necklace to, um, to uh, 
in, 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 in jihad so that the, the people could then cause pain to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala specifically mentions now that he shall soon enter the flaming fire and his wife as well. Hamma latal hatab. Now it's important that we understand is latal with a ta, hatab with a ta. Right, because again, the, the 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 it said that if you if you don't read these letters correctly, you'll change the meaning. So hamma latal hatab, that woman who carries firewood bound together with twisted rope. That this was one of her qualities. She used to basically do this, and she used to cause pain to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah says, Fiji diha hablum min masad, and in retribution around her neck in Jahannam shall be the same twisted rope. So what's going to happen is because she gave her necklace away. So she will have a twisted rope of fire in Jahannam. So Allah protect us all. You know, this surah, wallah, it teaches us uh, something, uh, you know, very, what we need to do is we need to ensure that we don't be a barrier in the path of Allah. Like this, these two individuals, they became a barrier uh, in the path of Allah, uh, in the deen, in, in, in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi works. So we need to also ensure that we don't become a barrier and we don't cause harm to anyone, especially those people who are serving the deen of Allah. Right. If we do that, then this can be our final outcome as well. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala um, forgive us all. And then we have Surah Ikhlas again. I'm not gonna. Surah Ikhlas was revealed in Makkah Mukarramah. Some people came to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They said, "Tell us about your Lord." You know, again, it was a mocking kind of thing they said tell us about your lord you know how is he is he a he is he a she is he made of gold is he made of silver is he made of you know uh, wood so these kind of questions they asked nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam so then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed uh, this this amazing surah right which nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentions that reciting it you get the reward of reciting one third of the quran and the reason why we, you know, this surah is so special is because it contains the fundamental aqidah, you know, with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It contains our fundamental beliefs with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Qul huwallahu ahad, that say, He is one, Allah. Qul huwallahu ahad, Allahu samad, right? Allah is independent. Samad means that He needs no one and He needs nothing, but everyone and everything needs Him. That's what Samad is. So it can't really be translated as independent, but that's the meaning of Samad. That Allah needs no one and nothing, and everyone and everything needs Allah. Allahu Samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He has no children and is not anyone's child. Right? He has no children and he is not anyone's child. And this is again aqidah. Wa lam yakullahu kufuan ahad. And there is none equal to him. Meaning you will never be able to imagine Allah SWT. So you know this, this question that they were asking, that is your Lord made of gold? Is he made of silver? And this is subhanAllah. Walam yakullahu kufuan ahad. Allah is non, non equal to, there is none equal to him. So you know, sometimes children ask you, you know, Abu, Ammu, you know, how is Allah? You know, you know, how does he look? Where is he? So the, what, the, the ayat that we are supposed to tell them is, is this. Qul Allah is one. Allah is samad. You know, children, we need Allah. Allah does not need us. Lam yalid. He has no children and he has no parents. Walam yulad. Walam yakullahu kufuan ahad. And there is nothing. So you will never be able to imagine or you can't, you can never compare anything or anyone to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's what children tend to do. They, they like to compare, right? And, and so this is how we should answer to those children who kind of ask about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We won't be able to understand Allah, how, you know, that there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's Surah Ikhlas. Then we have Surah Falak. I'll just quickly do the tafsir of both of these surahs together. These two surahs were revealed. Labid ibn A'asam. So Labid ibn A'asam, I'm going to finish now. Labid ibn A'asam was a Jewish person living in, sorry, yeah, was a Jewish man who was living in um, Makkah, Mukarram. I think these surahs are Madani. I'm not sure. Um, I might be mistaken. Maybe mistakenly I've put it as Makki. Um, I'll just quickly check it. But yeah, so these two surahs, they were revealed together. Labid ibn Asam, he, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had this uh, boy who used to come and do some, um, you know, khidmat and some jobs in his house. So is it Madani? Makki, okay, so these two surahs are Makki. Okay, sorry, they're Makki. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had this slave boy, uh, this boy that used to come and do some work in his house. And what Labid did was he asked this boy that can you get the comb of 
the Prophet sallallahu alaihi So this boy, he, he got the comb of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What they did, they took the hair of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they then did jadu. They they did black magic on Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam by tying knots. So you know nafa thati fil uqad, nafa thati fil uqad, which we read in in the surah. It's referring to those girls and and those women. And he is referring to the the daughters of uh, Labid ibn Asam that his daughters, what they did was they blew on knots. They tied and blew on knots, i.e. they were engaging in black magic. So what happened? They, they tried to cause harm to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alhamdulillah, it didn't really cause that much harm to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam apart from a few things. It, it, it did, uh, but it, it didn't have much of an effect on Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, Nabi Sallallahu there were certain things that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would forget the basic things, not wahi. Not wahi. There were certain things. Oh, have I done this? Have I, have I, uh, you know, these certain things Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa would forget. And this went on for a few months. So what happened was one night Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sleeping and he saw two angels came in his dream. One sat besides the head side of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and one angel sat next to the, uh, the foot side of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One said to the other that what's happened to this person? What's happened to him? So the other one replied, that sihr, some mashur, you know, he's someone's done jadu on him. So the other said, who did jadu on him? So the other one replied, Labid and his daughters. So then this one replied, where, where, what did they do jadu on? What did they do this magic on? So the other one replied that they did it on the hair, on his hair. So then they, the, the angel said, where is that hair? So then the other one said, it's in such and such a place. So when they said that, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam woke up and he took a group of Sahaba, they went there and they found that hair. And when they took the hair out, and again, I'm like, I'm doing fast forward here. When they took the hair out, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these two surahs, Surah Falak and Surah Nas. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam read Surah Falak. And remember, Surah Falak is, it has five verses and Surah Nas has six verses. So that's 11 verses altogether. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited them, them two surahs and every verse he would recite, the knot would be untied. Right, so it would basically open up, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would feel that lightness. Subhanallah, you know. And after he completed Min al Jinnati wa Nas, then the entire jadu went off Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that just shows that how powerful these two surahs are. And this is why we are highly encouraged and strongly encouraged that after every day after Maghrib and after Fajr, we should be reciting these verses that the surahs, Surah Ikhlas, Surah Falak and Surah Nas. And no one can do any kind of jadu or black magic or nazar on us, inshallah. So I'm not going um, to, there, there was more like this, this one surah, I'm going to just like this surah, surah Nas, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, min sharril waswasil khannas. Right, and you can imagine Allah is finishing. They need the, the the Quran Sharif is ending on this surah, right? So this surah must be something special, a special surah. And on top, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is mentioning the the word waswas. That here in this surah, we are seeking protection from Allah from what? From the mischief of the whisperer, of the whisperer. Yani waswas al khannas. Yeah. So waswasa is something which is very detrimental. Very detrimental. Waswasa is the whispers of shaitan and not of shaitan also. You know, these thoughts that keep on coming into our heads. Waswasa can destroy a person's dunya and also can destroy a person's akhirah. So we need to really safeguard ourselves from overthinking, from waswasa, uh, from allowing shaitan to put waswasa in our heads, from allowing people, minal jinnati wan nas, because jinns, shayateen can put waswasa, can whisper, and also people. Sometimes, you know, it's just one message an individual sends, or it's just one thing an individual says, and that then sticks into our hearts, and that waswasa, you know, and then we start thinking, oh, well, this, is it like this, is it like that? That can take our deen away, it could take out, it can destroy our dunya as well. So that's, uh, so, I'm sorry, I just, um, you know, we've just kind of, we've had to quickly, um, finish it because it's a lot to cover uh, but jazakallah everyone for um uh you know uh, for being patient and this thing i hope it, inshallah uh, it, it will be beneficial like i said um this is like it's not a tajweed course that we're doing so please do go back to these the links that have been shared and again uh, do study the the tarjama now do study the translation of these surahs and you know how we said that keep this in mind keep this in mind now inshallah whilst reciting these surahs, you'll be able to keep them in mind. I'll just pass it over to my colleague, uh, Mufti. Uh, is Brother Mubin going to take over now, inshallah? Subhanallah.
Ji, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakum Allah khair, um, Imam Saab. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Mufti Dilwar Saab, inshallah, to go over the rules pertaining to Tarawih, inshallah. If there is anybody who would like access to the slides, um, if you just drop um, a message to the Nusrat al-Islam host on the Zoom chat, um, inshallah, we will send you across the slides. We've already sent the slides to a large number of you guys, alhamdulillah. But if there's anybody else who'd like access to that, please do send us a message on the chat and we will send that as soon as possible, inshallah. So I'm just going to hand over to Mufti Dilwar Saab, inshallah, who will address the rules pertaining to Taraweeh. We have received a few questions as well, but I think some of the stuff will be covered in Mufti Saab's slides. And then we will um, continue um, answering the questions if time permits. Um, so Mufti Saab, um, you're unmuted now, inshallah, if you want to take over. Alhamdulillah. Just confirm you can hear me, inshallah. Ji, alhamdulillah. Crystal clear. Right, perfect. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Nahmaduhu wa sallam ala Rasulil Kareem. Inshallah, I won't take too much time. Uh, it's already past the time where we schedule to end the session. So very briefly, inshallah, um, I'll go through the rulings pertaining to Taraweeh. So if you can see here, the first hadith that I've put on uh, the slide, moving by. Um, it, 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 the reason why I put this here, moving by, yeah. so the reason why I put this hadith here is because uh, it's a time, obviously, it's an unprecedented time, and uh, uh, you know everyone's worried about the Taraweeh Salah. Um, you know, every year we get to the masjid, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful atmosphere, beautiful feeling. The spirituality of Ramadan is actually felt in the masjid when we're performing Taraweeh Salah, something unique to Ramadan. But obviously, due to the, uh, uh, the unfortunate circumstances, we won't be able to perform Taraweeh in the masjid. So a lot of us will be deeply sad saddened okay, uh, of the fact that we can't go to the masjid, okay, let alone read Taraweeh Salah. So something of upliftment here, the Prophet ﷺ says that a person who suffers an illness or is in a journey, okay, and he couldn't perform the actions that he usually does. So let's just say, you know, he'll read his nawafil, he'll read his Quran, or she'll read in her Quran, and all sorts of other nawafil acts a person does. Because he or she is ill, or they're traveling, due to that they could not perform those righteous deeds, Rasulullah is informing me and you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that he will grant us that reward, even uh, despite that we've not done or carried out those, those, those actions. So similarly here, during the month of Ramadan, we usually perform our taraweeh in the masjid uh, with jama'ah, Okay, and due to the fact that we can't, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the reward regardless because it's an intention that we had and it's something that we've been doing previously. So, nonetheless, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to uh, shower us with his mercy and bless us with the, uh, with the rewards of taraweeh and performing in congregation. So, um, I think I'm sure Imam Sab already spoke about the uh, emphasis, uh, uh, emphasis on taraweeh and the importance of it, but just to clarify. Okay, Taraweeh is an emphasized sunnah. Okay, sunnah mu'akkada. It's a really emphasized sunnah, and I don't want to go to the nitty gritty of the hadith and everything else. Uh, the time won't permit. But when it comes to an emphasized sunnah such as Taraweeh, when a person continuously leaves it out, you know, without a valid reason, then a person actually becomes sinful. So a lot of people think, oh, it's just sunnah, uh, we don't need to do it, and so forth. Actually, it's a sunnah mu'akkad, it's a very emphasized sunnah. And if a person does not perform it continuously without a reason, okay, just due to laziness, um, the, the person will be sinful. Okay, so again, like I mentioned, it is the month of Ramadan, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the virtue was mentioned in the beginning, okay, that person who stands in, uh, in salah in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives his past sins. Okay, so it's extremely important that uh, we do perform our Taraweeh Salah. Okay, so very briefly, it's 20 rakats, as everyone knows, there is a discussion, okay, but, uh, you know, it's been the sunnah, it's been the practice from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until today, okay, only like the last, you know, 100 years, maybe there's been a discussion, or should it be 20, or should it be less than that, but ultimately, 20 rakats have been the practice of the majority of the scholars, okay, uh, till today. So we should be performing for, uh, 20 rakats, continuing to perform those 20 rakats at home. Okay, so it's in the sets of two, as we know. Um, some people, you know, uh, say, can we read it in four? It's a common question we get, okay, uh, especially ladies who are sitting at home. Okay, so to perform four rakats instead of two, so four times five, okay, um, it's makru, it's disliked actually to do that. Okay, for taraweeh salah, 
uh, it should be performed in two rakats. So two rakats um, times that by 10. Okay, but if a person does decide to read it for uh, in four units as four rakats, okay, which is makruh disliked, but it still will be valid. And then um, sitting down, okay, this is also another common question we get asked a lot. Okay, can we sit down uh, and perform our taraweeh salah um, even if we don't have an excuse and those elderly who have weak legs and so forth or, or a weak back, okay, can they perform the salah sitting down? So again, here also it is prohibitively disliked, okay, to sit down and perform your taraweeh without a valid excuse. Okay, so those who are elderly, um, you know, who have issues and if they want to perform the salah or taraweeh salah sitting down, then they may perform it sitting down. But otherwise, whoever's healthy, they should read it standing up. Um, the time of Tarabi Salah, again, very simple. Okay, it starts from Isha time, okay, all the way till Fajr. Another misconception amongst our communities that they feel that Isha can be read, I mean, Tarawi can be read only up to a certain time. Okay, you actually have all the way till Fajr. So if a person is tired in the beginning time of, you know, of Isha, they might, they might want to nap and sleep and, and then wake up and then read the Tarawi Salah before Fajr. Okay, so they've got their time all the way till Fajr or the beginning of Fajr time. Okay, when they end their Sahri and, and they start their fast. Um, Ish, um, Tarawi Salah is performed after the Farad of Isha. Okay, so you read the four rakats first of, 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 of Isha, then the two Sunnah of Isha, and then the Taraweeh of 20 rakats. And after that, you read the Witr. Okay, and if for whatever reason a person missed um, the Taraweeh Salah that night, they couldn't perform it for whatever reason, they cannot make it up the next day. Okay, so just like Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, Fajr, if a person misses it, they have to make it up and do qadha of it the next day or whenever they get the opportunity uh, as soon as possible. But when it comes to taraweeh, um, there is no um, compensation and there is no making up. You can't do qadha of it. You'll just have to do istighfar and tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiving, uh, for, 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 for not performing taraweeh salah. Yeah, so the method of taraweeh is very simple. Okay, it's just the same as any other salah in terms of recitation, in terms of the actions and everything else. The ulama, you know, um, they mention, okay, that, you know, especially during these days or struggling days and this month of Ramadan, we won't be able to go to the masjid and perform taraweeh in the masjid. Okay, so we should actually try to make uh, a room or dedicate a room in our house just for salah. Or not, sorry, just for salah, but dedicate, dedicate it in a way where, you know, it's clean throughout. Okay, it's a comfortable space. Okay, maybe preferably have some verses of the Quran or, uh, you know, make it in a way where it feels like you're in a masjid and in that place, in that area, there's no TV, there's no music, there's no nothing like that. It's just solely, you know, to perform salah and things like that. So if you could dedicate a room and a space like that, that would be really helpful to bring that, you know, that feeling, that spirituality again. Okay. And then, you know, again, the ulama advised that if you could set a time for Isha Salah, okay, that would be really good. Okay, rather than, you know, just doing it ad hoc at any time, okay, it'll bring that spirituality together where the family sits together and did Isha at a, at a certain time, which is uh, designated from before, or stipulated, okay. Uh, and then, again, because you're reading Salah at home, okay, if a person wants to, they should also give Adhan, okay, and also give Iqama for the Isha Salah. Obviously, there's no Iqama for Taraweeh, okay, but for Isha, they should give Adhan and Iqama and read in congregation when possible. Okay, and as for Taraweeh, obviously it, could, it should be read without Iqama. Okay, make intention of Taraweeh Salah uh, and then perform Taraweeh as usual. Okay, uh, when it comes to uh, reciting, okay, so um, again, um, you should recite whatever you know from the Quran. Okay, whichever surah is predominantly, obviously our people know from Surah Alam Tara, okay, uh, so, uh, till, till obviously Nas. And uh, mashallah, Imam Sabah has gone through the translation and the tafsir behind it. So inshallah, it should give you more of a uh, boost, inshallah, in, in reading the Quran and in reciting these verses and having more concentration and devotion in salah. Um, just a point you know, on this, uh, I, I heard Mufti Abdul Rahman mentioning something very beautiful and it's actually very thought-provoking uh, thought for myself and I'm sure for everyone else. He goes, um, you know, this, this virus, you know, this, this COVID-19 in a way, has brought, has brought a lot of realization into us, okay? And to a certain extent, okay, obviously it's causing a lot of grief to a lot of people, but to a certain extent, okay, it is a blessing in a sense that it's bringing us to a realization that, 
you know, we are so much in need, you know, of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we are lacking so much from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it's so sad that not even a single individual in our family can, can lead us in salah, can lead us in our deen. Okay, that so many people we get in so many calls, so many texts. Okay, that you know, what do we do for Ramadan? Oh, we can't go to the masjid. How are we going to perform salah? A lot of the brothers and sisters can't, you know, can't recite the Quran properly, you know, can't perform salah properly and so forth. Okay, they were relying on, on the Imam so much. Okay, so it's about a realization in us that we actually need to step up and put some time behind stocking on Quran. Okay, so it's a time, you know, in this pandemic that people were you know, uh, panic buying, okay, they're stocking up food, okay, uh, uh, and all sorts of other necessities, but how many of us have actually stocked up the Quran for ourselves, okay, it's a, it's a point and time that we really, really reflect, and Mufta also mentioned that, you know, it's a time where we actually need to think about, you know, developing or, 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 or nurturing Hufaz in every single house, okay, every single house of ours should have a half of the Quran, who could lead us, who could lead the Torah, who could lead the Salah, and who, you know, who can lead the actual family, Okay, in, in a congregation and so forth. So these are uh, inshallah aims that we should try to make, okay, and uh, intentions we make so that, um, you know, in the future, uh, in the, you know, we don't have such problems of this. Okay, um, so going back, inshallah, yeah, so, um, so in terms of reciting the Quran, okay, we should recite the Quran, uh, whatever we know, okay, so from, from Surah Alam Tara till uh, Nas, okay, and then after F, every four rakahs, so two units, two rakahs, then two rakahs, after every four rakahs, there should be a short break, okay, um, equivalent to the time that it took you to read those four rakahs, and that's the actual proper way of taraweeh, okay, taraweeh comes from the word tarweeha, which is the plural, singular, and the plural is taraweeh, which means to take a rest, so in between every four rakahs, a person should take a rest, okay, and during that period, okay, a person can uh, you know, it's famous that, you know, within our, uh, even in our localities, our masajid will see this posted, you know, paint, uh, uh, printed out, you know, with that famous dua of Subhanahu um, Mulki Wala Malakuti till the end, okay, that people, you know, tend to. So that dua specifically, okay, it's not a Musnoon dua, it's not something that was stipulated by the Prophet, nor is it a Mustahab dua, okay, it's not something that, you know, we should feel that it's Sunnah, something that we feel that we have to do. Okay, that little period, that break is for you to rest. Okay, and during that, you can read Quran if you want to. You can do a bit of tasbih. You can send durud upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, so tasbih, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allah akbar, la ilaha illallah. Whatever it is, you can perform. You can you can recite anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be that uh, that, that 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 dua. Okay. Um, as for um, how a person should be standing, okay, these posters must have been circulated so much around our community. Okay, so it's very simple. Again, best we uh, perform our tarawih salah at home in congregation. Okay, especially if there's male folk. Okay, and the women should also join if they want to. Okay, but if they do join, if they do have a congregation, how should they be standing? Okay, these posters have been circulated. So, um, you know, so if this is if it's just two males. So one, the, the male who will be leading will be in front and then the male that who's following will be on the side, a little bit behind, okay? The heels, his heels will be slightly behind, okay? And if there's, a, you know, male and female, okay? So the male imam will stand in front, the, the male behind him and the females behind the males, okay? So there's a, demonstra there's a diagram here, inshallah, which will help you understand how a person should um, uh, uh, sit in congregation. Um, sometimes, obviously, um, uh, not everyone's house is big enough or the rooms are not big enough for everyone to sit together or everyone to perform the salah together in congregation. So if, if they want to, you can also use two rooms, okay, as long as the imam, okay, is in front of you. So let's just say your room is in a way where the front room, okay, is facing towards the qibla and the room behind, then in that sense, the imam should be in the front room. And um, the rest of the congregation, if the rest of the people who can't fit in that room could be in the other room. If, if uh, you know, the Qibla is on the other side, then the Imam should be in the other room and the rest of the people in the other room. So basically, the Imam has to be in front. Okay. But that's only permissible if it's one room, I mean, if it's one, uh, one, um, one building under one, one roof. Okay. If it goes beyond that, then that's not permissible. 
and um, and lastly inshallah i hope that kind of clarified how uh, um, a person should be performing tarawih salah it's very simple um, just as how you read your any other salah you will be reading performing the tarawih salah in the same manner but in two units full 20 okay and then after that will be your uh, with the salah now q and a okay there's a lot of questions that have come through inshallah i will try to go through as many as possible okay uh, the most uh, um, you know common one that we receiving is can we read tarawih salah whilst holding the quran okay or reading from the quran okay so this within the hanafi madhab okay is not permissible okay because it involves excessive movement and it also involves learning from someone else other than the um, other than you know the person in namaz in salah okay so they have categorically said that it's, it's not permissible yes other madhahib do allow it okay but uh, in the hanifa madhab it is not permissible your, your salah will actually be void and invalid if a person holds the quran or recites from the quran whilst in salah okay so like i said to you in the beginning you know if taraweeh is something which you've been doing for the for the past many years and you actually intended to do it this year also okay inshallah you know if you don't have a half in the house or you're not half with yourself and you couldn't complete the entire quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful inshallah he will give you that reward okay so we shouldn't panic and we shouldn't be saddened that we can't complete the quran as we usually used to do or we can't listen to them the entire quran in tarawih as we used to do okay so in terms of holding the quran it is not permissible in the hanafi madhab uh, another question that we all uh, also received and we receive many times uh, we have received a lot of times okay is the virtual tarawih okay so can you know we pray tarawih following someone online Okay, so um, so let's just say the Imam Sahib is doing Taraweeh from the Masjid and there's a live transmitter, okay, transmitting the Salah or even Mecca, Mukarram or anywhere else, okay, we're listening live, okay, can we follow them? Okay, the answer is no, okay, simply no, and, and that's kind of unanimous between all the Madahib because, you know, the, the bare conditions are, are not, and the basic conditions are not met, okay, where the gathering has to be one and there has to be ittisal, there has to be a connection between the sufuf and in this case obviously it does not take place um another question was uh, with regards to dua in between the four rakats okay i mentioned that okay so there's no specific musnoon dua okay a person can read whatever they want to okay but if a person wants to read this subhanahu mulk wa malakuti again it's not it's haram or it's impermissible it's simple a person may read it it's just that you shouldn't intend that this is something sunnah okay uh, it's, it, it, the meanings are profound okay the words are really benefit uh, really profound so yes a person may read them if he or she wants to um, another question we received was um, you know can my child lead the salah okay again uh, this question we've got asked a lot okay so if the child is not balig okay and you know regardless of the fact that if he knows more of the quran or not okay or he reads better or not okay uh, it is not permissible for a non uh, balig okay to lead a balik jama okay a jama which has mature individuals okay so a child cannot lead uh, um, a congregation uh, another question we receive is what if my tajweed isn't good okay so if your tajweed isn't good then you know you know as imam sab, you know went through the tajweed rules you need to perfect your tajweed you know this is an opportunity as like i mentioned for us to gain uh, the basic skills of tajweed can okay, we perfect our tajweed and whilst we're perfecting inshallah we if we uh, perform the salah and read the uh, the khirat the, the best man as possible inshallah allah will forgive us and allah will accept it from it okay the condition is that we are still trying and putting that effort to correct our tajweed if we just say oh our tajweed isn't good and we continue praying salah just really wali really dali sorry and um, you know we don't we, we don't um, read it with proper pronunciation and so forth then we'll be sinful okay so we have to actually make intention that we are going to correct our tajweed and we're going to actively work towards perfecting it um what if we make a mistake and stand up for the third rakah okay um, this is very common okay this is not just tarawi within our own salah also but we make a mistake where um, you know it's, we meant to read uh, two rakahs and we, we made a mistake we stand up even four rakahs we stand up so what we will do is that if we remember okay before going into the sajda of this new rakat which we are performing we'll sit back down okay we did the tashahud we'll make salam okay at tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu till the end we'll make salam one side okay and then we'll do sajda with the two sajdas okay and then we'll get back up 
Okay, and then we'll end, end our salah as normal by reading tashahud, at tahiyyatu, then durood, Allahumma salli ala, and then dua after durood. Okay, Allahumma ni zalamtu, and then we'll um, make salah. Okay, so this is, this is sajda sahwa, okay, this is done for any mistake that we make. Usually, obviously, if it's uh, a one where we missed out, uh, um, you know, a, a, a wajib or delayed a farud. Okay, but in this case, um, we'll um, uh, make sajda sahwa. Another question we receive is, can an elderly, an elderly who is weak pay taraweeh sitting down? Okay, I've answered that. If a person is weak, then, um, you know, or an elderly, okay, it's clear that there's, an ex uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, there's an excuse, so therefore he will be um, excused. Um, another question we got, when a surah was revealed, was it revealed chronologically? For example, when the first verses of Surah Baqarah was, was revealed, the next time Allah sent the revelation was the next verses. All right. When it comes to the surahs, okay, it wasn't, um, the way we see the Quran today, okay, from Surah Fatiha all the way to Surah Nas, it wasn't revealed in that chronological, in that manner. Okay, it was actually revealed in a different way. But during the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is the way he used to recite in Taraweeh. Okay, and this is the way it has been formatted uh, and, and ultimately by Sayyidina Abu Bakr and then Umar and then ultimately by Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, which we have in front of us today. Um... Okay, during Taraweeh, sometimes I'm very tired. Can I pray eight rakats or 12 rakats? Okay, um, again, this is a very common question we get. So when it comes to Taraweeh, when we're very tired, okay, like I said, the time slot is all the way till Fajr. Okay, just before Fajr starts, um, uh, when we end the Sahri. So a person is tired, go to sleep, okay, and then wake up and finish the rest. Okay, um, you know, 10, 12, or how many rakats the person has left out. But if the person is really tired and there's no more time left and, 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 and there's difficulties, you shouldn't confine yourself to eight. Okay, because then it gives the assumption that eight, uh, Tarawi is eight rakats. Okay, whereas okay, Tarawi is 20. So if a person can read, let's just say only four. Okay, you know, if as, again, it's because of a valid excuse, a reasonable excuse, then yeah, read four and then, you know, you know, stop there if you want to read eight, read 12, okay, read 16. Don't, um, you know, confine yourself to the number eight, okay, because then that will give the assumption that Tarawi is only eight rakats, okay, whereas that's not the case, okay. So if a person is really late, um, tired, okay, and they're falling asleep in salah and things like that, then yes, you know, they can read, you know, less than what, you know, what they usually read, which is 20. But again, this should not be made a habit. If a person continuously does, you know, eight rakats or ten rakats or twelve rakats, a person could be potentially sinful because they are leaving out or emphasize sunnah. Um, so you said that it is makru to pray sitting down without a reason, isn't standing in salah farad. Okay, why is it makru? If you can answer it, please. Okay, so when it comes to farad salah, okay, it is for us to stand up, it is necessary and compulsory to stand up because taraweeh is not a farad salah, it's part of the nawafil. Or yet, albeit it is, um, you know, sunnah muakkat, it is one of the emphasized sunnah. Okay, so there is that leeway. We won't say it's impermissible. We'll say it's permissible. However, it is strongly or prohibitively disliked, if without a reason. Okay, um, I hope that answers that question. Uh, Mubima, are there any questions or is that it, inshallah? Ji, jazakumullah khair, Muthi Saab. I think that's the questions for so far, alhamdulillah. Um, so we have um, elapsed our time. I um, just want to say massive jazakumullah khair to everybody who's managed to stay on um, till this late. Um, unless there's any burning questions, I'll hand over to Imam Saab unless he has any other announcements. Um, otherwise, um, I will just give a final reminder that does, if anybody does need the course notes, um, please do um, complete that link that was shared on the chat. And inshallah, we will share that across to you. Um, so I'll just hand over to Imam Saab. Is there any final announcements from yourself? Uh, uh, just one announcement. Obviously, we just we'd just like to request everyone to please make dua um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this uh, matter easy upon us and that at least we get the last or the final few days of Ramadan uh, in the masjid, inshallah. Let's be optimistic. Um, we don't know. Um, we, we, we're not another three weeks, isn't it? So inshallah, if things do ease up and we're allowed to be back in the masjid, then the announcement is that today we had a mashwara. So obviously there's uh, two, three of us in the, there's two of us that, that lead the salah, that, that, sorry, perform salah in the masjid. 
So in the month of Ramadan, we don't want the masjid to be void of having a Quran khatam. So we will have a tarawih, but the, again, there's only going to be three of us um, uh, that will be uh, performing the tarawih. So what we've planned to do is we will be reading one and a half paras every day, inshallah, in tarawih. So we plan to complete our khatam by 20 nights, inshallah. So if, and we request everyone to make dua, inshallah, that if the lockdown is eased upon us and we're allowed to come to the masjid after three weeks, then we're hoping that the last 10, 10 days or the last 10 nights of Ramadan, we will do a full Quran khatam, which is three paras every single day, every single night in Taraweeh, inshallah. So the plan is that, so that those individuals who have never um, had a Ramadan without a Quran khatam in Taraweeh, it will inshallah help them uh, to inshallah perform Salatul Taraweeh and the, uh, do a khatam of the entire Quran in Salatul Taraweeh. So that's uh, an announcement. I'm, I'm only sharing it so that um, we uh, just a request for du'as that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for us so that at least by the end of Ramadan, if we have 10 nights remaining, and uh, the masjid is inshallah uh, open again and everyone can come for Taraweeh, then we'll all be able to at least. Uh, have our Quran khatam in Taraweeh, inshallah. Jazakallah, Mubi. Ji, just have got one final question that inshallah we will address. I think it's a common one. Um, so Mufti Sahib, I'll hand over to you. Do we have to read the surahs in order in Taraweeh? So like Surah Kafirun and then Surah Ikhlas? Or can we sort of mix the orders up and what's the sort of um, recommendation on that if you could um, answer that? And that's our final question and we'll um, end the session, inshallah. Um, am I audible? Can, can you hear me? Gee, alhamdulillah. Yeah, all right. So, okay, yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so reading surahs in order. Mm, the ulama mentioned that it should be read in order. So let's just say in the first, uh, first sorry, it, it, when it comes to the two units itself, so the two rak'ats. Okay, so then the, in those two rak'ats, okay, the surahs should be read in order. So let's just say in the first surah, uh, first rak'at, you then, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al fi. Then in the next rakaat, you should read something that's after it, okay? I mean, li ila fi Quraysh, um, or anything after that. Yes, ulama also mentioned that you shouldn't miss a surah out and then read the next one. So in this example, first rakaat, you did alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al fi. And then in the next rakaat, you shouldn't leave um, li ila fi Quraysh and then go to ara'it al -ladim. Okay, so you shouldn't miss one, uh, one surah out in between. Okay, but in terms of the other uh, two units, you can read what uh, you know any other two. Okay, but it's just the two rakat itself, which are you, which you're reading together. They should they, they should be done in order. But as for the other two rakats, which you're going to read next, it doesn't have to be the, the the surahs don't have to be the ones that are after. It could be any, as long as you're doing it in order in those two rakats. Um, I, I hope that kind of um, answers the question, inshallah. Ji, jazakumullah khair. That does answer the question. Um, and just as a tip, as Imam Sab has covered, we covered the 10 surahs from Surah Fil all the way to um, Surah Nas, there's 10 surahs. So if we were to stick to that order, for instance, it will be very easy for us to know um, which raka we're on because this is a question that also has come about in different circles. Um, I don't know how many rakats I've read, inshallah. So maybe that will also assist with that question, inshallah. So unless there is any other final um, announcements from either Mufti Sab or Imam Sab, just want to say again to everybody who's managed to stay until so late. Jazakumullahu khairan. Ahsanul jazaa. May Allah bless you for this. Um, and if you do want the course notes, please do um, complete the form. And inshallah, uh, we will see you in our next session. Um, the masjid has got a Telegram channel, which you can subscribe to. Inshallah, it won't be overloaded with chat um, because we want to focus um, our time in Ramadan away from WhatsApp and social media, inshallah. Um, I'll post the link on the chat so that you can subscribe to that. Um, so, Zakumullah khair again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.